Uh, he's uh, going to do a, a session about uh, um, CF Engine and how they use that in his job to automate himself out of a job. So I guess it's also a um, uh, open uh, inquiry for a new job. <laughs> no, in fact, I'm starting Monday somewhere else. So that's, oh, okay. that's, that's another inquiry. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, Remy, Andrew. So, guys, welcome. Um, since a lot of people switch rooms, we talked before this, uh, Sean was talking about the uh, one one operation is what we're all about. And one of the cool things he showed, I also use while telling people about the configuration methods. And that actually explains it in a very simple way, especially to non-technical people. So go have a look what happens here. So this is configuration management very easily. When you have to explain configuration management to managers and stuff, you just tell them, define the setting, and it will always be working like this. So that's pretty interesting. So what's the story today? First, I'll uh, present the use case that uh, of implementing configuration management in an already existing environment. And then we will zoom out a bit, and I'll tell you about the steps to take to implement configuration management in your uh, organization or in your team uh, when you're already working there. It basically boils down to whatever happens, we should just use configuration management because that's really the way forward, it's very interesting. So let me now introduce myself. My name is Amy Bergswein. I am an engineer that loves building and managing infrastructure based on open source technologies. And it is my goal to automate what can be automated. So everything works rock solid, and I have the time to explore new tools and techniques. So that's a win-win situation, because that usually leads to even better automation. So until last year, I worked at an internet service provider, and my final project there was merging two uh, companies, two ISP companies, on this new shiny private cloud. And when I had automated everything around it, um, I decided to challenge myself, because I just wanted to get something into something new. And I did that by accepting a job in a completely different environment than I ever had ever worked before. So I joined an enterprise Linux team. So that was cool, right? So let me define enterprise, because that can be anything, right? So in this case, this was a semi-government organization. And there were around a thousand people working, so quite big. And in fact, this organization was building its own software. At least they tried to do so. So that's why we have around 150 IT guys in the company. So that was pretty interesting. It was a very classical uh, defined um, organization. So of course, development and operations had probably separated in their, their own units. So no DevOps there. And even in the um, operations unit where I was working, there were many different teams. I mean, there were teams for everything, all separated by specialty, mostly. So you, you've got the Windows team, the networking team, the storage team, everything, application management. Actually, for every application, they had their own teams, and it was very interesting. And I joined the Linux team, so it was quite interesting to me. And before I tell you anything else about this, uh, team that I joined, let's just meet the team. I'll, I'll show you uh, the team that I joined because that will probably give you some idea of what the problem was that I needed to fix. So you're still in the, 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 <laughs> still the right slide, so don't worry, this is not a problem. This is the team, more or less, that I joined. And we were very busy, we were working very hard uh, to fix all kinds of problems. Actually. Well, most work was done in response to some crisis or problem or whatever, so it was all reactive, more or less. And, well, you know, we were pretty good at it. I mean, look at the picture, we're even smiling, right? So <laughs> <laughs> and we were good at it because we had so many of the same problems over and over again that we, we knew the solutions already. So we just, oh, this problem again, fix it, and then it was done, and try it again, etc. There was just, um, well, there was a major problem with this approach. And that was that our users, they weren't happy. Because they didn't like the, the same incidents all over again. And they just couldn't understand why they had to keep asking us the same things. So 
And let me give you a simple example of, of such a situation. One of the cool things that had been automated properly was the deployment of new servers. So you could just spin up a new machine and could just use Pixie Boot, and there was this menu where you could choose one of the five operating systems that you support, press a button, and it was all done. So that was, that was pretty cool. And in this installation was included um, a postfix layer. To the end of the postfix. Um, this was because everything was on an internal network actually, and some servers had access to uh, the outside world using in the militarized zone. So in order to send an email, you just had to relay it somewhere, of course. Um, in this installation, there was no relay defined. So we would just automatically deploy all kinds of servers, but the mailer was broken. So we got a lot of calls from our users. So, hey, can you please fix the mailer on this one? Hey, this, this is strange. I'm sending an email and it gets stuck somewhere. So what's going on? So that's, that's what they really didn't like. We get many, many calls of them, almost on a daily basis, and it was kind of frustrating to our users. So when it was about three months in the team, something interesting happened. And that was that our team lead left the company, and I had to replace him. So we talked in the team, and I um, suggested to change the way we work. And then we came up, while we were talking, uh, with this mission. We wanted to go from firefighting, like shown picture, to fire prevention. So, referring back to the post fix example, we would just want to fix it once and for all. I mean, problems occur, but just make it work. And don't frustrate your users with all kind of the same problems. So, I had used configuration management before, so I already knew that was the solution to this problem. I had used Puppet in the, uh, when I was working at the uh, at service provider and worked pretty good, so that was interesting. So the first idea was to use it again. But then we ran into some interesting problem. And that was that most of the servers that we were uh, running over there were running Java application servers. So their memory had been tweaked uh, a lot. So there wasn't just much room left between the operating system and the memory on the side. So simply put, we couldn't afford to run buckets. So that was interesting. So what we did was review all the configuration of those tools and select the one that was um, that had the smallest memory footprint. And that's how we ended up with GF Engine 3. It's a very small memory footprint. It's written in C, it's pretty cool. It was new, so that was interesting as well. And that became our first building blocks. And this solution we built were actually three building blocks. Git for version control. C of Engine 3 was, of course, configuration management, and then we used Fleetwood for testing. So, about, um, about Git, I strongly believe you should always use version control. Because that brings in flexibility, and it allows you to revert back to some earlier known to work good state. So, if something breaks today, you can always revert back to yesterday's situation. We're already said by the previous speaker as well, but this is also very important to see the history of what you're actually doing. And in fact, all that you're doing, which are non technical, all also love this version control. Vagrant, we are using for testing because we had these five different operating systems. Now that we want to use configuration management to control everything, we better be sure it would actually work on all operating systems. So, what we did was uh, using Vagrant, you can just define a Vagrant box, which is like the template, so you could just spin up new virtual machines and use them over and over again. And those boxes were defined to be the same as if you had installed them using Pixie. So we had clean servers to test with and then used uh, uh, the, the, the boxes to, to use the test and to spin everything up. This is the workflow that we were using. Features uh, we would create on a separate branch. So you could work on multiple features. Multiple team members could work on multiple features. And you could just commit whatever you wanted on that special uh, feature branch and do any work that you wanted, uh, you wanted to do. Once it was done, once it was tested using Vagrant, when it was working on all operating systems, we would merge this to the development branch. And everything in the development branch should at least work, should be tested uh, using Vagrant. 
um, the only issues you that may arise are some integration issues because if two two features are developed at the same time and you both put them in the development branch, there might be some conflict. So that's what we resolved over there. The next step was to add a little bit of testing, and we did, that's where we're using the, uh, the beta branch. Those were actually real servers that were running in the data center that had the same characteristics as the other production servers that we would deploy on, but, it, but it were just not so important. So we, those were our own servers that we used to compile, for example, RPM packages or whatever. So we had like 10 servers or something to use for this beta branch. And in fact, that gave us a very good view of how everything was working. So, then it's get interesting, because there's the difference between pre-production and production. And in fact, they were the same. But what we did was try to involve our users in this whole process, because they, were not, they weren't happy anyway, so we had to give them some attention. So we wanted to show them uh, a way of uh, cooperation or something. So we asked them, could you please assign us a few of your servers? And on this service, which are production servers, we will deploy the configuration management code that we think is production ready, but we want you to verify. So we ended up having like 25 pre-production servers that were selected by our users. Well, you can use this one, then if something breaks, it's less important. So we, that really built a lot of trust. And then we first would deploy on the pre-production. When everything worked okay, and we, we especially used it in the beginning to gain trust, and later on, those, the time gaps between those the, the merges became smaller. And now, actually, I don't really think they're too much interested in this anymore because they trust it enough. They, they know we're doing a lot of great things. And finally, you uh, we bring it into production, and we scale it to around 450 servers at the moment, so that works pretty good. Cool. Let's have a look at how the Git repository looks like, just it's, it's a bit simplified. So you see all the branches over there from production all the way up to development. So everything at the top, so the NTP feature is actually in every branch, and then you go up. At the top, the Apache feature is currently being worked on, there are two commits, that, that's, that's uh, <laughs> really, uh, be working. So, if it's ready, if it's working properly, you, we would merge it to, um, to the development branch, right? Like we did before. And we want to do that with a single commit. We want atomic commits because later on, if something breaks, beta for example, we want to be able to revert just one commit and not two, or three, or five. So that's very important. We also shared this uh, Git repository in readme to our users, so they could actually see what we were building, what we were doing, and that was a very open way of working. So if they submitted the problem, they would see another committee, etc. So involving users in this whole process is a very important thing, because they look from a different perspective usually. So you can think of improvements yourself, but trust me, you'll get better ideas if you involve your users into this. And they'll, they'll like you for it, because they, now they finally understand that something is changing and that we're building something that actually gets better and better. So in one of the meetings that we had, we were discussing what we wanted to do, and we asked them, well, well what, what, are there any uh, things that you want us to add, etc. And then there was this guy that said, well, you know what, I, and whenever I log into a server, since we have five different operating systems, I always have to find out which operating system this is running on before I can just uh, do my work. And of course, this isn't that hard because I know the whole line by hard now, but it, it's pretty bad. So, this is what we ended up with. Whenever you SSH to a server, it's, very, it's a very simple promise, only such amount of code, maybe 10 lines, and just print all the information of the network. And now everybody would just log into the server and immediately see, hey, this is Red Dead Enterprise. It's actually production, you should be here. It's, that's why we made it in Red. Etc. Some, uh, some extra information is there as well. So that's really made a lot of difference, even those small things. So finally, our users became happy again. And we saw a significant drop in the number of incidents that we, that we now had, because we were fixing problems 
um, proactive now. So if ever anything happens, it would be fixed on all of our servers. So the question is, how did we do that? How can you do this yourself? So how to get started? Because if you want to start this and you're firefighting, then you're very busy. So how do you find the time to actually start working? So when I was looking back at this whole process, I found five different phases, five different steps that you can take. So the first step is you should find out what to fix. So that's where the WTF is for, right? <laughs> Now, of course, there, there, in this, there will be a lot of, I mean, this is a tech over secretary, this is, there will be a lot of what the fuck's up. Because you're just entering a team saying, wow, what are they drinking? What's going on? So you should just get an inventorization to find out why is everything working as it is, and make this list of problems you want to fix. So this post-fix thing was on our list. And why you are creating this list? Um, because you really want to find out what problems occur the most. And the thing to do next is to find quick wins for those problems. So one of the things we did was quick fix the process trouble. We just did an ugly way to solve that issue and we knew we would be fixing it later on for good, but now at least we were uh, rid of the cost. Another interesting quick win for us was uh, installing updates. And it sounds crazy, but we were hitting a lot of bugs that had already been solved, but nobody cared to install the updates. So we did, and that saved a lot of time as well. And the thing here is, you need to buy some time to install, to, to, to invest in the, in the final solution, because you, you will want to implement configuration management. That's really important, because that's, that's the way forward. So how do you start this? I would suggest, if you want to start configuration management, first of all, just choose one of the tools. Doesn't matter which one, just go get started. Doesn't matter. Find a peer that's already using it, use the same tool, doesn't matter. Then start building your baseline. And the baseline is your, I mean, try to find maximum five configuration, configuration items that are the same on all of their servers. So what we did was, we wanted to manage the root password, we wanted to manage SSH to make sure you couldn't log in root, we wanted to make sure NTP was properly configured, and I guess we had the shoe doors, only four, that, that's it. So it's pretty easy to, to start building this solution. And then it's time to start scaling, because when you uh, have this baseline, you, I would suggest scaling it out to all of your servers. So go at the beta servers, then pre-production, finally production. So you end up having configuration management on a small part, but on all of your servers. And this is actually very powerful. Because when you have this in place, every next uh, configurator item you will add to the mix will be really powerful. So we added postfix to the mix, and we were, were just testing in the five operating system. When it was done, everything was solved. And you can add every uh, uh, configuration item that you actually want, and it will really pay off quickly. So, and then, this is how we eventually found the time to automate everything over there. So the final phase is the black. Because you're now in control. Everything is in configuration management, everything works rock solid. There is a downside to this whole approach, to be honest, because you might get bored. Once this is done, I don't know what you should next. You should, you should, you should look for your next challenge again. And that makes it even more interesting. So one of the things I did was visiting conferences. So I went to the CloudSec Collaboration Conference in Amsterdam, and I attended the talk by Chris Buitaert, who might just be here. And he was talking about the future of system administration. It was a very nice talk. And he quoted someone from Google, and he said, every 18 months, automate yourself out of your job. So that's pretty cool. But don't be afraid by the your joke part, because actually it means whatever it is that you're doing today, manually, you should not be doing it eighteen months from now. So that's very interesting. And that really made me realize I should either look for a next challenge within the same company or run to something more interesting. Since the semi-government part wasn't really my thing. Done. Let me recap. If you want happy users, happy team members, happy stakeholders, happy everybody, you should replace manual work with operations. 
I told my told about five steps to get there. So find out what to fix, implement quick fixes for the things that are going to It will buy you some time. Invest this time in configuration management. Start with a baseline and scale it up and out so you will include everything and you will be in a very nice position. There is just one extra thing I want to add to the slide. So, you know guys, there are a lot of tools out there for configuration management. And in fact, don't fight which one is better or try to do this and that, etc. Because the most important thing is that we all should use configuration management. So whatever happens, do use configuration management. Because that is the software that will really help you. And it will bring stable <coughs> environments. And that's what we all want, right? So that's very interesting. So tell everybody, spread the world about this. Configuration management is really good for you. So if you want, guys want to get in touch, I'll be around. I, mean, I, I did not cover a lot of technical details because, because I only had 25 minutes, but there are some of the technical details on my blog, so go have a look there. Or go talk to me, we might have a few minutes for questions at the moment. The slides will be posted uh, anytime soon. In fact, I automated that part as well, so we'll see. Anytime soon there <laughs> should be a tweet flying, so uh, go have a look. Twitter handle is over there. So, thank you very much for your attention. Right. So, we have one minute left to show. <laughs> Anybody wants to ask a question or as well? No, we were in this very siloed environment where we were not allowed to touch any windows. So we did not, but in fact, I think it's a good idea to have this abstract layer above your infrastructure. So it would be a good idea to manage infrastructure actually, not just the So if you can do it, I guess the chef can do it as well. So that would be very interesting. Yes, you. Yeah, I think it's yeah, that was part of a challenge. The question is, well, did you have any trouble getting everybody on board, all the other team members? And the turning point really was uh, when I became a team leader. And that's, that's a little bit ridiculous, maybe. But that allowed me to just uh, involve everybody and make an open communication. And, and, and that really helped getting people in. Just had to uh, be asked for their ideas, etc. So everybody was actually quite uh, enthusiastic about it. Really, it was interesting. <laughs> we did break things, so that's that's the thing where great power you know, comes with great responsibility. But the good thing is, if you're breaking a great power, you can use the same power to fix it again. To make it power but you should be really careful about uh, implementing this, and this you should really use different types of uh, branches and versions before you ever hit something to production. So the, the question, I guess I understand what you mean. The question is, well, if you're um, using the operation, do we have enough time? Can you implement it fast enough? Is that what you mean? To, because our users were um, requiring us to fix some things, and they were quite used to the firefighting approach and do it directly. And now we we having uh, a which takes a bit more time. We thought of this as, as well, and in fact, it turns out not too many things are um, need to be done immediately. So when we were up to speed, we could we could release fairly often. And in the event that we really did have some fire that needed to be fixed now, and we couldn't use configuration management, we just fixed it by hand and then implemented configuration management for this piece so it would be deployed. So you can still, a lot of things to do is using a hotfix. Maybe we can talk about it. Uh, yeah, I think we're, uh, we're done. Thank okay. you, Amy, for your talk. Nodding heads that I saw.